Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be able to discuss this topic with you today. Um, it's very exciting. It's something that I didn't expect to see in the scripture. So let's open with prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time together. And God, I don't think we could ever say thank you enough for giving us your word. And Lord, I also wanted to do a special, just a special thank you today for the opportunities that you've given me and for the opportunities that you've given my friends on the other side of this computer screen. We love you so much. Amen. Today's I am statement is I am an opportunist. Now, I know that sounds like a very negative concept, but I want us to just take the first couple of minutes and say, what is an opportunist? What does that word mean? An opportunist is someone who takes or takes advantage of or notices when an opportunity arises. Okay. Now in today's world, especially during this political season, um, it's been really hard because opportunist has become a really bad word. We've seen a lot of the, I don't know, the politics, the procedures, how people do things. They take advantage of an opportunity and that's not a good word. But there are also ways that you can take it, take part in an opportunity, to be aware of it and capitalize on it. And God says that he designs those. So I'm not talking about selfish opportunity. I am talking about God ordained opportunity. And we're going to start by reading the word right directly this I am statement. Then from there, we're going to veer off and we're going to look at an example in the Bible of an incredible man who became very good at opportunities. And no, it's not Paul this time. We're picking a different person. But you see what we mean. You can go back and you can say, wow, Paul really was an opportunist. So let's start. And we're going to be in Colossians chapter four. Now I'm having a real rough time. Um, the medicine that I'm taking right now makes my mouth super dry. So please bear with me if I have to keep drinking. Okay. All right. Here we are. We are on Colossians four. And in case you didn't notice, my little bug is in here. This is my two-year-old grandson. Say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. He's in here playing. And we're going to see, you know, at first when he came in, when I was videoing, I'm like, oh, no, I'm never going to be able to do this. But then the Lord really kind of struck my heart and said, Jack, you're talking about taking opportunities. What if this is an amazing opportunity for him to hear his yaya talk about the Bible? So we're in, um, we're in the office, not my, not my desk, but we're in the office and, uh, he's just playing behind me in my father's chair and he's playing with Papa's fire truck. So he should be okay. Oh, and look at that. Look at my sweet love. That's Maddie girl. <laughs> and she is bringing me a cup of coffee. How can we get better opportunities than this? And you know what? Her doing that is it just warms my heart when I see God put details together because little did she know that she was taking an opportunity where her, her mama was sitting in here and I had just told you what struggle I was having with my mouth. And what happened? Maddie shows up with a cup of coffee for me. Do you see that without even knowing it, Maddie has a servant's heart without even knowing it. She saw an opportunity to serve me and it's become so embedded in her that she doesn't even know she does it anymore. So that was the perfect example, the perfect example of how Christians can be so accustomed, become so aware and so habitual about taking opportunities to serve that they do it sometimes and don't even realize. So I'm so glad you got to see her. All right, I know he's pretty cute, so he's distracting, but let's, let's try to do this with a kid in the room. All right. We are at Colossians chapter four, and we're going to be reading verses one through five. And it, it does blow my mind. We're going to be reading right here. Yes. You need your Bible pen. Yeah. Here. You want your Bible and your, your papers? Okay. There we go. Um, so let's read it now. Oh. And I want to tell you that this is Paul oh. that's writing this verse, this part of this chapter of this book, Colossians. And he's writing to um, a group of, of, of Christians, brethren, who are just 
in a church in the middle of a land um, that had a lot of influence from those around them. And he is giving them this beautiful monologue about what he is trying to explain to them that Jesus wants from them as a church, as Christians, as Christ followers. Okay, so let's read it. Masters, grant your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Now, guys, I cannot apologize. Uh, during this time in history, there was slavery. And um, as ugly and unfair that is, God did speak to that. And in this verse, he says, if you have a slave, you better treat them well. So we can't get sidetracked by that. Yes, slavery is in the Bible, and it's very hard to read about. He Then verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God may open up a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. Okay, did you see all, did you see and hear all of those beautiful things. Now, Paul tells us right here, hey guys, I know you're focusing on your behavior, but could you also focus on prayer for others? So in these in these six verses, there is just an overwhelming amount of instruction. And so we're gonna look at these and we're gonna focus obviously on, on verse five. But before we really hone in on verse five, I want you to take a minute and I want you to just kind of tick off the list of what Paul is saying to the Christians of how they should live. And notice where Paul is, what Paul is saying he has experienced. And he has experienced imprisonment. And he is still giving these words. Now, if I was in prison, I don't know if I'd be telling other people, oh, be nice to your friends and neighbors. I would probably be saying, get me out. I didn't do anything. Get me out. I'm innocent. But Paul does not do that. Here we go. Paul takes the opportunity of being a Christian in prison and still talking about how to make good opportunities. All right, so let's just click off these first couple really quick before we get to verse five. Uh, treat other people with justice and fairness. And he says, do that because God has been just and fair to you. So he's giving them a proportion of how they're supposed to be. They don't get to pick what kind of justice and fairness that they're giving to others. God picked it because their example to follow, to live up to, is what God has done for them. That's a tall order for us Christians, to treat other people like God has treated us. That in and of itself is, it just seems too big to do. But remember, we learned before about the power of God, dunamis. Remember that word? The power from God to finish what he's called us to do. Okay, now look what it says. Devote, devote to prayer, keep alert, attitude of thankfulness, praying for others so that other people can come to know him. Be uh, Conduct yourselves with wisdom, and when you are with outsiders, now that's a that means people who don't know God. Um, that does not mean um, that there was segregation. It means people who had not yet come to know Jesus, who were not yet Christ followers. So he's saying, with them, be a part of noticing if God gives you any opportunities that you can reach out in and it in God's way. It blows my mind. And then he talks about how you talk, that your speech has to be grace and seasoned, and that we actually have to put effort into knowing what to say in each opportunity we're faced with. This is a beautiful concept. There is no way to say in any other way, but God says he wants us to be an opportunist. He wants us to take every single opportunity that he lays before us, not for selfish gain, but for God's glory and the gain 
of God's kingdom, the gain of people's lives. Okay? So when we are an opportunist, it is not, God is not giving us permission to be selfish. Actually, to be an opportunist in the Bible is that really you're not thinking of yourself at all. You're thinking of other people. And that becomes what's so important. Now, we are going to follow one person for just a little bit of time here. Um, and then if you want to, I would love it if you went to Facebook where Jot and Tittle is and get your extra worksheet. Um, I am going to put a challenge out there to you. Caitlin and I are trying to figure out how to make uh, Jot and Tittle a little bit easier, and we have no idea. So if any of you have any ideas of how to kind of try to combine it or make it easier for you, please, please send us a comment so that we can fix it. Okay, we are in Acts, and we are going to be in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. And you're going to see an amazing opportunity and how God was in control of this opportunity. All right, here we go. Ready? She put cinnamon in it. What an opportunity did she serve me. Mm, thank you, Lord, for such sweet people in my life. Okay, we are going to start at verse 26, and we're going to read down, and, and, and it's quite a bit of reading, but it's worth it. Here we go. Verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Now, Philip was an amazing man. Um, he was part of the intimate people that followed Jesus. So he got to see and observe a lot, a lot. And so he's talked about in, in some of the books of the Bible as a as a character that's in this story that is very vital in, God, in Jesus' story. And so we don't spend a, time, a lot of time on Philip. Um, you know, there's no books written by him or about him. He's just mentioned here and there. But in every case that he is mentioned, it is incredible. It is incredible. To me, he is one of the most beautiful opportunists you would see. Okay, so now we know who this is. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And he arose and went. Talk about obedience. Even after God told him it was going to be a miserable trip. Who wants to walk on a desert road? And behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, we got to stop here because this is almost laughable. It's almost too crazy to believe, but we know it's true. It's in here. And, and, and he's giving an account of a story. This isn't a parable. This is Paul, uh, excuse me, this is Luke telling us an activity that he witnessed. And, and so we know this happened, but it's unbelievable. All right, so let's set the stage. There is this chariot coming down the road. Now, Philip had been sent by God to this exact desert road. He told him to go somewhere, but he did not give Philip permission to make his own directions. He told Philip exactly what road he wanted him to take. Now, some of you may think, no, that's an exaggeration. But after all that we have studied about how detailed God is, we have to believe it. If we don't believe that God exactly picked this time and this road, then really everything we've learned up to this point must be a lie. Well, I'm not ready to say that. So I am all in in believing that this is exactly what happened. So Philip, God has Philip on this desert road, and up ahead of him comes this chariot with an Ethiopian servant in it. And this Ethiopian <laughs> had been sent to Jerusalem in, in, as a liaison to the queen of Ethiopia. And at this time, Ethiopia was so bountiful. Um, one of the things it traded was, was animals. It, they had exotic animals and, and kings all over the world. They wanted those kind of animals because it made them cool. So do you see how amazing of an opportunity God is putting there? And Ethiopia was not a God-following nation. Not at all. So 
How did he have a scroll? You know, there weren't very many people that owned a scroll because at this point, they all had to be handwritten by a scribe. So when you think about the, the, just the details, that an Ethiopian was sitting in a chariot and he had a scroll of the book of Isaiah. Now, I have a speculation about it, and that's all it is. That's all it is. Please don't put it any more weight than a speculation. I wonder if the Ethiopian queen, who was going down to Jerusalem to get a lot of things that were going to be transferred to her country, I wonder if she bought a scroll. Because that would be worth a lot. So I don't know, but this man had a copy, and it was not because he was a Christian. All right, here we go. Isn't that just so amazing? All right, here we go. And we're going to pick up at 29. And the Spirit said to Philip. Now, this is capital. Guys, the Holy Spirit prompted Philip to know what to do. You know, if 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 we don't have a relationship at listening or being prodded by the Holy Spirit, we have the chance of missing every opportunity. And if we if we do feel that prodding from the Holy Spirit and we shut it down and say, oh, no, 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 that's not for me. Somebody else can do that. Then we also miss God's amazing opportunities that he wants to use you and me to do glorious things for him. That's really cool. All right. So the Spirit spoke to him and said, go up and join him. <laughs> go up and join this chariot. Okay, first God sends him on this desert road and says, this is the way I want you to go. All of a sudden, this man comes, and by all uh, clues that we have in the Bible, Philip was um, probably a brownish color, um, and this Ethiopian would have been a dark black color. So they weren't even the same race. They were not the same anything. And God says, go get up there in the chariot. I just think this is hilarious. This is, I mean, this blows my mind. And when Philip had run up, he not only obeyed God, but he ran to obey God. I I wonder if he had to run to catch the chariot. I don't know. But the Bible tells us that he ran to go do what God told him to do. And he heard, he heard the Ethiopian reading Isaiah, the prophet, and said, do you understand what you are reading? Now, there's a couple things in here we need to pick out. And, and, and again, you can choose to believe this or you can choose to skip over it and say, no, that's just too crazy. He says he heard the Ethiopian reading. How in the world did that Ethiopian know Greek? How? I don't know. Most of the world at this point did speak um, Aramaic or Greek because the early church was so influenced by Greek culture and Roman rule. But I just think that it's a detail that God included in here. It's one of those jot and tittles that you're like, oh my gosh, he was reading it aloud. All right, here we go again. (laughs) And Philip says, do you understand anything you're reading? And the man said, well, how could I understand unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. really happening. Can you imagine what was going through Philip's head? He was sent on a mission and he had no idea what God wanted him to do. And he finds himself in this position with a man from another country. And he was, even though he was an Ethiopian eunuch, his service to the queen, he was there on royal business. Um, And we know that because the queen's men's the, the servants and the dignitaries, they had to be neutered because the queen was considered to be so beautiful and they didn't want anybody to accidentally fall in love with her or purposely try to have any kind of sexual contact with her. So the fact that he was an Ethiopian eunuch really helps us understand his position. And he was representing the queen. And so here he is. And he says back... <laughs> He says back to Philip, how am I supposed to understand unless I'm taught? The one part I want to point out, and and this is probably just a Jackie thing. 
you know, there's, there's every reason to believe the Ethiopians respected the Israelite people because this wasn't the only time an Ethiopian representative went to Jerusalem. And, you know, this man was sitting in a chariot reading the Bible, all that there was at that point, which was a lot, the entire New Testament, uh, excuse me, the entire Old Testament, including the prophets. And he was reading it. And I want you to notice the understanding didn't come first. The reading did. It's okay that sometimes when we read, we're like, uh, uh, I don't get it. And that's why it's so important for me. And that's why I've just made it my, my later life desire is to get people to keep reading the word because the Holy Spirit promises that he'll teach us from it. So take example of this man riding in a chariot. He just kept reading and he admitted he had no idea what he was reading, but he kept reading. And this was a beautiful opportunity. So let's see what Philip does next. So he gets up in there. They pick up where the, where the Ethiopian was reading. And this was the scripture which he was reading. Verse 32. He has led us as a sheep to slaughter, as a lamb before its shearer is silent. He does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. Now that may sound very confusing to you. But every single word in that was a prophecy of Jesus that had come to be fulfilled. So again, it's in all caps. So you know this wasn't the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. Obviously, we know where to find this original verse because we're talking about Isaiah. And that's the portion he was reading. But I want you to understand that this was a prophecy. And if you go through and you read it, you can see very clearly that it was Jesus. So here again, I want you to understand how crazy this opportunity is. God had put this particular portion right in the perfect spot of the scroll. So when the Ethiopian was reading, he was reading this part. Okay, do you understand that when God opens an opportunity, he opens an opportunity? Let's pick it up at verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this of? Of himself or of someone else? And Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this very scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, then you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azalus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Okay, I don't know if you really heard. I'm sure you did. Do you see what happened? What happened when God put an opportunity in front of Philip? that God had ordered that opportunity. What happened? Somebody came to the truth of who Jesus is. And we know it must have been very real because according to this passage, it was the eunuch who asked, can I get baptized? There's water right there. Now remember, we had already learned it was a desert road. So they must have been traveling quite a while talking about this scripture. And they landed by water. What would happen if, let's go all the way back, if Philip would have said, oh, I don't like desert roads, God, they really are hot. I don't enjoy them. Um, let's find a different way to go. The story wouldn't be the same. What if when God said, you know, Philip, get up in the, in, in the chariot with him. And he's like, oh my God, I'm not getting in the chariot. The story would have been different. All of this was. 
I want you to notice verse four, verse 40, sorry, before we, before we go. But Philip found himself at Azalus and he passed through. He kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. This opportunity that he took so empowered him that he talked himself all the way to where God had called him to begin with, to Caesarea. How many opportunities came because of that one opportunity where Philip was obedient? Um, there are, in, in your worksheet, you're going to go back a little bit more in Philip's life, and you're going to see why. You're going to see an event in Philip's life where there was an opportunity and he was on the other end of it. He was like that eunuch. He was the one who didn't know. And somebody took an opportunity for Philip. So that's going to be in your worksheet. Um, instead of going and covering that, I feel like I need to tell you a story. Um, Caitlin, my daughter-in-law, you, you, you finally have met her. Um, she was her and uh, my goddaughter were teaching a, a class the other night. And it was the first time that they really taught a class like that. And so they were both really nervous and it went well. Um, and when they came home, um, somebody, excuse me, somebody at the teaching said there was some leftover food. And they gave it to Caitlin to come home because we have a large family. And it was lunch kind of food, you know, uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, things like that, um, and some non-perishables. And so she was like, oh, yes, thank you. I will take those home. Those are going to make great lunches for us. And so in the car, and she's got my six, my 15-year-old son in the car because he had went and babysat the children at, the, at, at this class. And <laughs> she sees this homeless man. Well, that's very common on our street corners around where we live. There, there's a couple regulars that are at very every day or, or all the time. They're at the same location, so it's not unusual to find a homeless person around when we on our ride home. And so she saw this person, and she felt the Lord prod her, and she's like, "God, I can't do this. I have one of my babies in the car. I have, you know, my 16 year old." little brother in the car. I can't stop. I don't have any money. My husband's not with me. He's not going to be okay with me stopping and talking to a stranger. And so she kept him hawing and him hawing. So she pulled into the parking lot um, that was by the corner that he was standing. And sure enough, my goddaughter passed by and was like, that's Caitlin's car. So she pulled in. And so they had this big conversation. And to make this story just a little bit shorter, I, I wish you could hear it. Maybe Caitlin will share it to you some other day. Um, but the details that led up to this. So she finally went and said she was going to be obedient and that she was going to trust God because she could not, she just could not get rid of this prompting from the Holy Spirit that she was supposed to do it. So my goddaughter stayed there. You know, my, my other son was in the car. And so she went up to this man and this man had been praying and asking God to do something. And the opportunity that she got to talk to this man was those kind of things that you only see in a movie. You know, there's some Christian movies that, that make it look so easy. Well, this man was open to everything she said. Now, that was not an opportunity that she would have ever chosen to have. Never. And with God opening up that opportunity... It wasn't even in what she is good at. I shouldn't say that. She loves people. She has this empathetic heart, but she is not easy to talk with. She doesn't, that's uncomfortable to her. Her private life with Jesus is so deep, but yet she's very shy. Um, and so her obeying God in this, there is a new man whose name is written in heaven, who is eating some beautiful peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a lot of imperishables. And it was because Caitlin recognized this was not an opportunity from her. This was an opportunity from the Lord. And that opportunity had great gain. Of course, God calls us to be an opportunist, as long as he gets to be the one 
prompting you to what are his opportunities instead of what are our opportunities. I hope that as you read more about Philip, and and again, we've talked about Paul so much, you can go back and reread anything Paul wrote and see that he was an opportunist, opportunist as well. No matter what situation he was in, no matter where he was, he always managed to talk about Jesus. Um, when we got home makeover, we knew that there was nothing that we did to deserve it or earn it. it nobody could deserve or earn this. Nobody. I don't care who you are. Um, and so it was very, it was very puzzling because, you know, Aaron and I were just normal people uh, behind the financial eight ball because we had so many kids and um, that was a better choice for us. We would rather have kids eating macaroni and wearing hand-me-down shoes than those kids to be homeless and we eat steak. So we made a purposeful choice to live poor because of that. But when home makeover came, we just could not understand why God would do that, why God would would give us this. It just didn't make any logical sense. And so Aaron and I, uh, as we were discussing it spiritually with God, we made a commitment to God that if anybody ever, ever said any word about this house, we would stop and we would tell them how amazing God is and how this house really happened. And so... I remember, and we still do this. This is going to be year, I think it's 13. I think this is year 13 um, that we've had this house. And that's nuts. That's nuts. And so people still stop us and ask us. But I remember that first year in the first few months, it had not become a habit for me, but I had made, my husband and I had made this commitment to God. And so I was in uh, the grocery store and I had a couple of my kids, the kids were, were a lot younger then, and I had a couple carts and the kids were helping me pull. That's what grocery shopping used to look like. And uh, I saw a lady going into the store. And as she was going into the store, I saw out of the corner of my eye, just as she was making it in, she went, she did a, a double take and she went. And so I knew, I knew that she recognized me as the mom that got the house. And I'm like, Jesus come on, Lord, I've got two carts of groceries. I've got my kids. You seriously? And my, the spirit prompted me kind of like this and said, did you, did you tell God you're going to do this or not? I did. So I got my kids in the car. They weren't so young that they were dangerous in a dangerous situation. I got them in the car and I ran back in and I caught up with her, you know, just as she was getting ready to shop. And I said, hello. And she said, is it you? And I said, yes, I saw you. Look at me outside. She said, I did. She said, I knew that was you. And at that moment, the most remarkable thing happened. She asked me why we got the house. Yeah. And do you know what I said? Because God and I got to share the story of Jesus Christ. And at the end of that conversation, that woman was crying And I looked back and I said, Jesus, I get it. I get why you gave us the house. It wasn't for us. This entire house is an opportunity that God has placed for us to talk about Jesus. Because everybody wants to know why we got the house. So I want you to take note. You saw Maddie today serve me. Took an opportunity without even realizing it. You heard about Philip and the crazy opportunity. You heard what Paul said directly, a a message from God saying, you are to take every opportunity. So please be brave. I know it sounds so scary, but be brave and be an opportunist. All right, guys, I love you. I'll see you tomorrow.